our next speaker is also in the healthcare area, and it's uh, George Weber. And uh, George Weber is a, uh, a fully engaged, uh, committed CEO who is also, who was once uh, Secretary General, President of the International Red Cross, still advisor there. And so for him to be on our, he's been our, our Secretary Treasurer for quite a while. For him to be on meetings, he's flying off here, flying in here, having meetings in New York, ducking. And he's still so passionate about requisite that he's been on the board for quite a number of years and is an active, he's engaged and gives good advice. So we, we love that kind of commitment. And uh, uh, George is also unusual in that uh, he has used, uh, he's worked with Ron Capel as consultant in using RO in three organizations over many years. I thought that makes an interesting story. Okay, so with that, uh, can I introduce uh, George and Ron? Ken, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. I recall what my grandfather once said, that he said, praise is like perfume. Um, sniff it, but don't swallow it. <laughs> Meaning that you can only, you can only, you're only as good as your last achievement. So, you know, so it's a constant, uh, constant era of uh, achievements uh, day by day. Anyways, a little bit about, uh, a little bit to uh, expand on what um, Ken said about my background. So, um, I've been a chief executive officer for uh, 32 years, so it kind of dates me. Uh, and I've run, um, run uh, four different organizations over that period of time, and I'm currently in post. I'm currently the president and CEO of the Royal Ottawa Healthcare Group, which I'll introduce more formally, I'll set the context a little later on. And uh, three of the four organizations I have, um, we have used uh, requisite uh, organizational um, principles and, and practices. Uh, the first one, I, I hadn't been introduced to it when I was first a CEO back in, uh, back in uh, 19, uh, 1983. Um, and so it's been about a 20-year journey um, using RO, and throughout this journey, um, uh, Ron Capel from Capel Associates uh, has been by my side uh, throughout this whole period of time. So beyond being a, a professional colleague, he's become a, a close friend also too, and has helped me out of some very, very difficult, uh, difficult situations, which we'll describe in a minute. So uh, kind of following um, what was suggested to us by the organizers of the, of the conference, we're going to kind of have a TED format and that we're not going to show any PowerPoints. Uh, we're going to just uh, talk and we're going to have a dialogue. Um, we're going to set some context and then Ron's going to ask me a serious question, a little bit like uh, Warren. And I'm going to reinforce some of the points that uh, John just gave about uh, uh, dealing in the, uh, in particularly in the healthcare, healthcare situation. Um, uh, as we as we go forward, and uh, again uh, dealing with three, and we're just going to touch uh, the surface in all these three organizations, and hopefully afterwards we can have a, a Q and A and a little bit of a dialogue on on some of the challenges or certain areas that you would like a little bit more uh, a little more in depth uh, in depth uh, description on. So the the three organizations that that uh, that I have headed and currently one heading is first is the International Federation of Red Cross Red Crescent Societies um, in '94. Uh, I was appointed took over in December of 92, uh, but we started the design work back in 94, and it's part of the International Red Cross, Red Crescent. Then the Canadian Dental Association, which was a quite a, a, different organ a different type of organization in 2000, and then currently the Royal Ottawa Healthcare Group, which I took over in 2007 and, and started working on org design and RO in, in 2008. And in each of those organizations, I was a newly headed uh, newly, uh, newly head of this part of the organization. In terms of the International Red Cross, I was the first Canadian ever to uh, head that organization. It had been headed by uh, many other nationalities before, before that period of time. Maybe, Ron, I'd turn it over to you to say a few words also, too. Great. Um, bas basically, as George said, in, in each one of these situations, and going over the 20-year period, the, the process was somewhat similar. Um, we, would, we would come in and work with George and his group in doing an assessment. Uh, they'd make decisions on what they wanted to do, and then we'd work with George and his group in terms of implementation. 
Uh, I'm not going to talk about how we do assessment or how we do implementation. Tomorrow morning I'll be doing a keynote and I'll talk about both of those things. But at this point in time, it's, it's more the interest of these three organizations and the uh, success of them. In two of the three organizations, we also came back and did an evaluation. Uh, so not only were these interesting in themselves, but George also had an, inter an, an interest in the evaluation and to determine on a little more objective basis what the outcomes were and whether they made a difference or not. So um, with, that, with that preamble then, what I'm going to do is, uh, is uh, more or less interview George about these three. Uh, we'll go through each one successively. So we'll start with the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. And as George said, this work started in 94. And George, I wonder if you could, if you could talk a little bit about, about the organization and why you decided to do something related to organization design. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I took over in uh, December of 92 and of course had a, a year to kind of do uh, our own assessment uh, in, during 93. And in, in 1994, uh, the, uh, there's a little bit about the International Federation. It is the largest humanitarian network in the world today. Um, it consists, at that point, it consists of 149 National Red Cross, Red Crescent Societies, and the central body responsible for directing and coordinating international humanitarian assistance and, and improving the capacity of national societies to take care of their own humanitarian activities in their own country. At that time, we had about uh, 5,000 employees, uh, about 300 at headquarters, and the rest spread around, and about 16 regional delegations and 50 country delegations, and they were responsible for coordinating the activities of about 298,000 staff, over 100 million volunteers, and uh, aiding and assisting about uh, 233 million people worldwide. The, at that point also, too, the Federation was directly responsible for assisting about 15 million people uh, in, in, 90, in, uh, 90, uh, in 94. Uh, we also operated, which is a little bit more complicated, adds the complications, we operated in four languages, English, French, Spanish, and Arabic, and uh, we had 92 different nationalities working for us, 92. Big number, tough when you're dealing with different operating cultures and trying to deal with our own, bringing these principles and translating things of this nature. So why? Well, um, the main thing is, is that uh, when, we, when I arrived, uh, the gap between supply and demand was growing. In 94, just remember, it was, we were dealing with Rwanda and the consequences of the Rwanda conflict. There were hundreds of thousands of refugees in Tanzania and the Congo and the rest in conflict all over the place. And we were dealing with the major situation in ex-Yugoslavia, the breakup of the armed conflict in ex-Yugoslavia. Then we had many other operations that people, you know, the media didn't talk about because of the, you know, those were the two focus points at that point. And we could see that this, the world was evolving and there was a real gap between supply uh, and, and demand and the complexity of the operations uh, was, in, was increasing. In addition, along the way, um, the number of national societies were getting better things and they didn't want the, the Federation to do the actual work. They wanted the support and to coordinate. And so there was, the national societies were improving their capacities along the way, and the numbers were increasing. And so we had to customize the different services to each different country. So it was, uh, it was, it was changing and evolving. The volume of information requiring specialization was increasing exponentially. At that point, too, more demand for accountability, transparency uh, with, the, with the donors. And uh, we were dealing in a VUCA world. Uh, you've heard this term before, VUCA, a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. And it was increasing in leaps and bounds. So that's, uh, and I was, um, and I also should say when I took over, the organization had drifted. They had only an acting a chief executive for about a year and a half before I even got there. So, so again, when things happen, silos start to form and all the rest of it because the acting doesn't always take the same decisions that a, a permanent CEO would at that point. Great. George, um, could, could you talk about a couple of highlights of the change process? There were some interesting, unique, I think relatively unique, uh, factors in terms of what changed and, and how that happened. Well, I think, come, let me maybe deal with uh, some of the success factors and then something, uh, what was unusual about the situation. Great. 
clearly, uh, and I think this is kind of boilerplate when anybody that's gone through this kind of change process before, and particularly using our role, it was important to have a strong internal team that will kind of lead the change made up of a uh, front line, and we used people from uh, top management all the way down to front line folks as part of the a part of the internal teams and task forces, uh, supplemented again by Ron and his team who came in who provided the outside knowledge and constant urging and the methodology and all the rest of it. So, and having those teams, the external and internal team working together and being harmonious was a critical success factor in kind of moving it forward. When you're dealing with a worldwide organization, it's all about communication over communication. We know this is kind of boilerplate. You got to kind of, and again, operating in four languages, and I speak three of the four, so we're going around, and the CEO's got to be up in front and center, uh, running around and, and dealing with not only with the headquarters in, uh, in headquarters in, in, in Geneva, uh, but around the world in terms of the, um, of the delegations. And one of the things that you're dealing with in, a, in an emergency relief organization is the constant need to re-energize the process. You know, when we were doing this change process, and the analogy would be a, a painting the side of a destroyer at full battle stations in stormy waters. Just imagine that. So you're kind of dealing, and people are focused on getting the relief, trying to work at lives, and this and that, and, right, and you're trying to change and put structure into the organization. It's not always easy. It takes a little bit longer, and then you've got the, the pressure, you know, the barrier of uh, multinationals working with people from all different cultures in terms of trying to get them to understand this stuff, and they just don't have the knowledge and the background, the management experience to be able to deal with it. So um, the other thing that we did too that was unusual about this uh, situation is that uh, while we were trying to reorganize, we were also trying to um, develop a new de a strategic plan. So normally you do these things sequentially. You, know, you, have, you have a plan, strategic plan, business plan, and then you kind of you know, align your organization to deal with it. Well, we did in parallel. And it can be done, it's difficult, but we did it, we did it in parallel. And, um, and I guess in terms of what was also unique is that there was so much compression in our organization, we realized right away with Ron's help that we needed to move from a stratum five organization to a stratum six. Uh, there was just too much compression and so we moved from a stratum five to a stratum six. It was really it was an unusual situation in kind of dealing that and then lining up the people. Just to, just to add to what George said, uh, it was the first time I'd been in a situation where strategy and design were being done at the same time. And it was very interesting and it does work. And it's a very interesting iterative process. And in fact, what we found was that design drives strategy almost as much as strategy drives design. It's very much an iterative process. And if you have two groups that work together effectively, um, one can do that. I just want to add as well in terms of what George said in terms of moving from stratum five to stratum six. Uh, people, people now talk, there's now a word for it. It wasn't a word back then. The word is upshifting. And, and uh, what we found going in was that a stratum five organization was not sufficiently complex. It needed to be stratum six. These folks were dealing with the United Nations of the world and all kinds of other large, complex, high-level organizations. And, and you've got to be able to operate at the same level. You don't want to be outgunned when, when your people meet with the other folks in terms of deciding these uh, kinds of issues on a global basis. So the complexity was critical. Um, just one other question on that, George. Um, the, the other piece that was kind of interesting was that, uh, if you could comment on, was that in terms of the functional alignment, uh, you, you, you were clear about the strategy. But then in terms of the functional organization, it was really disparate. And it wasn't organized in terms of the disaster response on the one hand and the National Society focus on the other. Could you comment a little yeah. bit on that? Yeah, and it's clear because there was a bit of mixed system, a hybrid system before, and we did, uh, we just did, we did carve out total disaster relief coordination and direction as uh, one, one grouping, one division, and the other division, National Society Cooperation and Development. And of course, then you have to have cross-functional accountabilities related to that. The other issue, the other big issue related to all of this too is that given that the uh, country and regional delegations were run by the uh, disaster group and when a disaster occurred you had to have appropriate, appropriate um, uh, cross-functional accountabilities in terms of the headquarters and the, with the appropriate people, the headquarters and the field. 
constant, you know, debating as who's in charge and with the specialization like that, does the doctor report to the doctor in Geneva or does they do report to the doctor at the head of the regional, de the country delegation, so you constantly had that kind of battle to kind of fix along the way too, which got, got fixed during this uh, process. Great, thank you. So, so George, George was there for a number of years. Uh, he wanted to come back to Canada, uh, came back, had, had, a, uh, had a position as the head of the Canadian Dental Association. So this would be in, in 2000. And this was a very different type of organization than the one he was in previously. And maybe, George, you could talk a little bit about what that situation was and what yeah. some of the challenges were you had coming in. Well, the only one thing, I just want to go back to the Federation because uh, there's you know, a better <laughs> outcome, which is the mo most important outcome for me Great. along the way, is that with the ability back in 94, we talked about taking care of 15 million beneficiaries. And in 99, five years later, we were able to take care of over 30.2 million beneficiaries. And for me, that was a real, real achievement to kind of be able to deal with that kind of narrow the gap between supply and demand, which is a very, very important achievement for that organization uh, at, that, at that time. Well, my re-entry into Canada, um, for, and I had to come back because for family reasons, uh, I won't get into it, uh, uh, so I, my re-entry job was with the Canadian Dental Association, which was a completely different, a much smaller organization, and uh, it was an organization responsible for uh, representing the interests of the 19,000 dentists in Canada. Uh, and the kind of an advancing the profession plus also uh, promoting optimal optimal oral health. Um, we had a small, I went from you know 5,000 people to 60 people and uh, although it did have substructures, uh, accrediting bodies and we also set up a uh, for-profit high-tech company. So quite a different, uh, quite a different uh, situ uh, situation. And so I was moving from, the interesting thing, I moved from a, a level six down to a level four, a stratum four. Uh, and uh, that was quite challenging intellectually, which we'll I'll get into in a moment. So, if you ask your, and I get into why I have to, why I brought in RO at that point. Yeah, well, um, on, on on that one as well, George. Why did you decide to do something with the organization design, and what did you see as some of the key success factors in that situation? Yeah. So, I was a new hire, and this was a little bit more a traditional approach because they'd had a strategic plan, so it was really. At that time, they just finished strategic planning when I got there, although the organization again had been drifting. Uh, the CEO had been, uh, uh, they had had an acting there for a year. And uh, so it was again uh, doing it sequentially, had a plan, so it was a matter of aligning, aligning, the, aligning the people to deliver on the plan. There had also been an internal KPMG report on the um, organization that was very highly critical in terms of uh, effectiveness and efficiency in the organization. And there were some retirements and, and departures, so it made it a little bit easier to then use that opportunity to, uh, to, do, uh, to do bring in uh, bring an RO. And in terms of um, um, being a small organization, um, uh, one of the success factors was we were able to, and given they were all in one location, it was much easier to do our role because you could gain, engage everybody. All the staff were involved in this with an internal team, same thing, external, external consultants working with an internal team and so on, communication. So communication was easier because I could walk around and see everybody within, within an hour, so it was a much, much easier operation. I mean, the only thing unusual about that situation was that it was, a, it was just a type of not-for-profit uh, being that you can do RO even in a professional membership organization and the results were, you know, you have better staff satisfaction, the members were happier and, uh, and we were on a better financial footing too along the way. So it was a kind of a, a small interlude between two really big jobs. So. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it, it's a really interesting situation. Uh, we, we've had this I, in another case with, with a client going from, from a six to a four on kind of a temporary basis. And, and you, you kind of predict that there'd be a disconnect, that, that you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't uh, provide the direction that was necessary. But, but one of the things you find is that if you understand this well enough and you understand what the problems are, you can sometimes mitigate some of the risk. And, and I, think, I, I think in terms of George in that situation, one of the things he did was he mitigated some of the risk in terms of getting down deeper to provide some of the direction that was necessary. 
The, the other thing is that the temptation in that kind of case, and we, we've seen it in, in, in these situations, the other temptation is that you're going to apply your full capability and you're going to overly complicate this organization. This is a nice stratum for organization. You, 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 you don't want to overcomplicate it with all kinds of wonderful stratum six thinking. Uh, we, 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 had a, we had another situation with, with, uh, with an executive who moved from being a Stratum 6 deputy minister to uh, running, running a mint, which was a Stratum 4 situation. And in that particular case, she really needed to resist setting up all kinds of future stuff going out 10 years, <laughs> which would have just driven people crazy. Mm -hmm. so, so I think in terms of both of those challenges that George had in that particular case, uh, they were both difficult and, and both well, well met. What I should admit though, uh, Ron, you probably know this, is that I did do some in Stratum 5 and 6. It got me into trouble with the organization because I, was, <laughs> I did come up with some futuristic thinking. We're 10, 15 years away. Dentists were saying, no, no, no. I just want to know where my next dollar is coming from here and keep, me, uh, keep the dentist out of Medicare in Canada and forget about all this futuristic stuff. We don't, we're not interested in that. We want to know what you're doing for me today. So, so it did get me a little bit, but anyways. <laughs> That's good. Some of the thinkers of the group loved it, but you know, the majority were right. not so happy. Right. So, so then uh, in uh, 2008, uh, George moved to the Royal Ottawa Healthcare Group. And uh, George, could you maybe talk a, a little bit about what that organization is, mm -hmm. and in that particular case, why you decided you wanted to do something on organization yeah. design? And I'll pick up on some of the things from uh, John, because I was faced with the same situation that uh, John was with uh, one of the worst performing uh, hospitals in the National Health System in the UK. So the uh, Royal Ottawa Healthcare Group is, uh, uh, that, I, uh, that I was brought in in a crisis fashion, um, as, a, as a, an acting CEO for, uh, for theoretically for six months because I had another job to go back to in Geneva, but they asked me to do this job for six months and then they hired me permanently. Uh, it was in a, um, the Royal Ottawa is a stand, one of the st four standalone specialized mental health facilities in, uh, in um, the Ottawa, uh, in Eastern Ontario with uh, three different campuses. Uh, we had, um, we were taking, we take care of about 35,000 uh, patients yearly, had over 660 beds, both community and inpatient beds, and had an, um, have an employee workforce of about 2,000, including a couple hundred, uh, a couple hundred doctors. And doctors in Canada, along like other places, are not employees, they're independent contractors for the most part, so it makes it interesting when you're bringing RO into all of this too, having this two lines, of, uh, two, two, separate, uh, two separate lines. We also had a charitable foundation, a research institute, and, um, um, and given that we were an academic health science center, and not only did we do care, we do uh, teaching and, of course, uh, do, do research and, and advocacy. Um, in terms of why we brought in our role, uh, I came in and the organization was in crisis, and in Ontario uh, and other parts of Canada, too, when an organization is in crisis, the Minister of Health has the right to put a supervisor in, fire the board, and fire the senior management team. And we were at that stage where the press were, and were hammering because we were the first P3 hospital open in Canada, a private-public private, uh, private -public partnership. So some of all our hotel services were being run by the private sector, so they were all mixed when you talked about outsourcing too. You know, they're, the private sector is part of our management team, so it's a little bit different. And we were the first in the uh, P3 hospital to, to open, and it had its challenges, and the unions were jumping all over us about that. And, uh, and they were in major financial difficulty, and they had a leadership vacuum. Four out of the six top leaders, the vice presidents, had left, either been fired or left. And they fired, of course, the board fired the CEO and brought me in. In, in, a, in a crisis situation to deal with it so that they wouldn't be fired by the minister and a whole new board brought, brought in. So I was faced with a mess at that point. So the first uh, job uh, doing like John, it was to really kind of you know, put, the, put your finger in the dike, you know, deal with all the stuff that you had to deal with, uh, put in temporary management to hold, to kind of try to stabilize the organization. And then I asked Ron to come in Let's do a proper assessment here, and then move in with the with uh, with our own. And, and George, in, in in that 
setting, what, do you, what did you see as some of the key success factors and what did you see as some of the things unusual about that situation? Well, uh, in this one here, again, it, um, uh, it was clear um, uh, that you needed really a sustained CEO leadership. And this is where the CEO had to get really involved with the, uh, given the former one had been fired, was never around, and all the rest of it, it, it where you need to, you had to have doing a lot of walking around and uh, see there was a lot of CEO involvement in terms of hoping to kind of stabilize the situation and getting the organization ready to, to be able to uh, to be able to deal with uh, uh, our role and, and, and convincing the management team because it hadn't been done and when you have the doctors and the senior management constantly say well has it ever been done in any other hospital or constantly looking show us the comparators always show us the comparators we don't believe this is a, something for the private sector so a lot of convincing had to be done to a lot of skeptical, very bright people who were skeptical about uh, about uh, kind of a, the IRO methodology or practices. So a lot of work had to be done right at the right at the front uh, to be able to deal with that. Again, we set up the uh, same thing: strong internal team, uh, a very bright person, uh, one of our high potentials, took over as sort of the internal team uh, to kind of help drive this with external support from Ron and his team. <coughs> But also along the way, since it was a highly unionized environment, over 80% was unionized, I also set up a kind of an advisory group that uh, made up of union and frontline people who were brought into the tent, learning, uh, teaching the methodology along the way so that they could also be, uh, help us to kind of advocate where we were going with this, all, uh, with this situation. And they met every, every couple of months and the internal team would report to them in terms of what they were doing and how they were doing it and what the next steps. And that was very, very important. Had this group of advisory group made up of frontline folks uh, along, along the way. I also say that the institution itself was ready since it had drifted for a couple of years. It, the staff were ready for some strong leadership and wanting to know really uh, where, where are we going and let's have some clear leadership as opposed to the siloed thinking and operations that were that, that we found. Um, what was unusual, again, it's a multi-site done in a hospital. It's rare that these things are done in hospitals, uh, but it was done in a hospital. Highly unionized, uh, although that's not, uh, that's not different than many other cases a lot of you people have dealt with, but also at the same time, again, like we did like in Geneva, we also uh, was not sequential in terms of having a strategic plan and then aligning the organization we did the strategy and the design in parallel at the same time, which was unique. Okay, great. Anything else on, on that, George, before we move to outcomes? No, I think that's, okay. that, that's all. Okay, great. Could, could you talk about the outcomes then? There, there were a couple of different uh, measures of outcomes in this particular case. Could you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, I think, well, we, well, clearly we became, um, we were, we're a stratum five organization and that was made uh, very clear in terms of dealing with the, the um, um, stratum, stratum levels. Um, the, uh, what was really remarkable was the um, independent uh, work life studies in terms of 2008 where the baselines with the employees, how they felt about the organization. For example, only 15% trusted the organization at the end of 2010. 45% trusted the organization, and now it's even higher at that point. It's in the 60s and 70s. And in a unionized environment where there's a lot of cutbacks in healthcare in Canada, where hospitals are being, and particularly in Ontario, living in a zero environment, so it's a, a tough financial picture. So a lot of employees and unions don't trust you and like that. But we were able to move that trust factor, which is critical in terms of also putting in, uh, putting in, uh, putting in our role. Um, the, uh, we reduced uh, employee absenteeism. We had a proper plan put into place with uh, targets and indicators, starting to use much more data-driven data -driven, uh, decision-making, which is very, very important along the way. And one of the big things in healthcare, and particularly in the hospital sector, is the incredible high spans of control. What has happened in, in Canada and maybe in other areas is that um, in order to protect patient care, middle management has been stripped out because you tend to want to have uh, main t protect the frontline folks, uh, the caregivers, and management. So we had uh, managers, uh, frontline managers, responsible for 120, 140 people at times. 
and we were able to be, bring the spans of control down uh, to a more reasonable amount, still too high because you're running a 24-7 operation, but it, within, within our budgetary constraints. So we were able to find some, um, uh, some redundancies in some areas in terms of dealing with the gaps that we were able to free up some positions to be able to put some more managers back in, back in. Because hospitals, in, in, in particularly in Ontario and in Canada, are probably the, some of the most over-regulated uh, over institutions that you can find in, uh, in, in Canada, in Canada today. And so in it, when you're over-regulated, there's more, more people doing, throwing regulations. Every time there's an incident, government puts in more regulation and you've got to have the administrative structure to be able to teach the front line and bring them up to steam on these regulations. It's uh, very difficult when you've got, when you're managing you know, 100 and 140 people and you've got to do performance reviews on them and all the rest. So that was, that was a major, I think, a major achievement and of course dealing with the cross-functional relationships again, fixing, uh, fixing that. But, but it's, still a, a work, it's still a work in progress, I would say. It's, uh, it's, uh, it never changes. It's like uh, maybe Elliot always said, it's a semicolon and uh, you constantly work it because of the turnover and things in this nature and changing environment uh, so that you constantly have to work at this. George, could you also, in terms of, uh, in, in terms of outcome, we, we, we took a look at a couple of things. Um, one was the manager direct report alignment, kind of pre-post, and, and the other was uh, how the organization did on recommendations. Yeah, <coughs> so uh, the, the manager direct, uh, uh, manager frontline folks uh, alignment was at 20% when I think when the first the assessment was done and at the end of the, uh, the, the um, implementation of the design, it was up to 97.5%, which was a real achievement. And um, uh, for, sorry, the, 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 the other one was the 30 recommendations. Ah, yes. Yeah, so there were 30 suggested recommendations, and one of the one of the things that we did in order to re-energize the process, which I always think you always kind of have to re-energize the process after a year and a half, two years of uh, trying to move forward on it. Um, we were already we had 30 suggested recommendations. The man, senior management team had accepted um, all the recommendations, and at that point, about a year and a half in, we were, I think, uh, 30. I uh, think about 25, 30 percent had been uh, had been fully implemented. Another, uh, the other about another 60, 70 percent had been uh, partially implemented, and are pretty pretty well implemented uh, today now in 2014. Great, thank you. Uh, I just want to underline one of the points that George made. Um, the, the, the manager direct report alignment <clears throat> and span of control is, is critical, as we know. And in hospitals, in particular, there are these budgetary constraints. So you've got these high spans, but you can't add people in. So, so what, what we were able to do is find some mid-level positions that were individual contributors. Uh, and have them start to manage people at the next level down. So without adding bodies to the organization, it was possible to add management horsepower and reduce the spans of control in the organization. So that was an interesting constraint uh, that the group was able to, uh, to get around in terms of making significant improvements in that area. So in terms of, in terms of uh, our, our comments, uh, this wraps up that piece. Uh, what we'd like to do is open the floor for questions. I'm wondering if, if you guys can talk about two things in particular that are related to healthcare, maybe specific to Canadian or but uh, One is the role of the physician, the physician leader, and how they fit into the management operating system. And the other one is the challenge that the, the unions impose on structure and restructuring and those kinds of efforts. I wonder if you guys could just comment on those two. Great. So, so one part of the question is, is physicians, and the other part of the question is unions. George, could I yeah. turn that over to you, please? So uh, <clears throat> in Ontario and other parts of Canada, under the uh, Public Hospital Act, um, uh, physicians uh, have, are not employees uh, of hospitals, although in some cases now, and that is slowly changing now, uh, coming along and now a number are, uh, but um, they, are what, they are what is known as given privileges to uh, operate in the hospital and in uh, Ontario, uh, physicians are the only ones that can, at this stage, although um, uh, nurse practitioners are bringing them in this right also too, but physicians fundamentally are the only people allowed to admit and discharge uh, from inpatients in hospitals, so you need 
doctors on board. But the doctors uh, having privileges and not in the kind of the management line, uh, one has to operate with them a little bit a little bit differently, although they are part of the teams. We do have a chief of staff who is part of the uh, is part of the uh, is part of the staff, and they and they would have a couple of uh, assistants uh, assistant chiefs under them, and they kind of manage the uh, manage the uh, the, the uh, manage and lead the physicians, and um, and the chief of staff reports to reports to me. Uh, for the quality work, but also has the right to report directly to the board on the on the quality on the quality of care. Um, so it is very difficult to um, when a physician is um, uh, misbehaving, so to say, in quotation marks, uh, to get rid of the person because then you've got to withdraw the privileges. And to withdraw privileges uh, is meaning is taking away their ability to work. So it's very difficult in a convoluted process uh, to. Um, to get them to, um, uh, you know, to, to manage their behavior, although that is slowly changing now. Uh, we've been able to put performance reviews in for all the physicians and through their, through clinical, uh, clinical directors, heads of the program, which are, are funded partly through our global budget, so they work partly for the corporation. But it's a very challenge, so it's slowly changing, but it's still challenging in that these are independent, uh, independent contractors uh, that work for, that have privileges in our, in our in our in our in our facilities, and they are a critical to any RO. You got to bring them on board also too, because they have so much influence in terms of how uh, how a team functions, uh, a, a clinical team functions together, and and, and who they also have a, a you know an influence in terms of the staff mix and skill mix in terms of who they want to help to take care of the patient, because they're ultimately accountable for the the care of the patient. So they have to be brought on board, and they're not always, and they're very skeptical about anything because, you know, they're used to having evidence base and show me the evidence, show me the proof that this works, show me the proof that this is going to make a difference to the clinical outcome of my patients by doing all this reorganization. So it's a, it's a, a constant challenging, and that's why sometimes it takes much more longer to convince some of these uh, uh, in, in a hospital sector to do uh, RO because of all the convincing and, and, and uh, work that you have to do to, um, to prove to them that this is going to make a difference. Uh, and we've overcome that. Uh, in terms of a union, it's the same thing. Uh, unions are skeptical, but they see it as a, uh, as a way of downsizing because you've got financial difficulties, you're bringing in RO practices, and you're going you're gonna to whack all of us, and you're going to change all this, and we got all these privileges, and we we have these positions, and these are the job that they do, and all. It can it, it it can be done, but again, it's a lot of it's a lot of work in terms of because these unions are very very powerful, um, and the doctors have their own union also too, and the nurses in particular are very very powerful, and our largest workforce in the hospital sector are nurses, and the unions are very very powerful, and any change has got to be negotiated up to the yin yang in order to bring this in. So it's a lot of work to do RO, uh, but, it, uh, it, it, but it proves its worth and it, uh, it is an excellent methodology even for hospitals, notwithstanding some of these, uh, some of these barriers that you've got to overcome. Good, thank you. Jerry? Uh, first of all, I'm, uh, congratulations to both of you. I think this is groundbreaking work, uh, bringing RO into healthcare. And uh, I'm very impressed and very humbled by what you've done um, most of the work that we've done with healthcare has been at the top two or three levels of the hospital and the medical staff. Um, and we're increasingly being asked to look down the hospital organization. Uh, and what I have not been able to resolve in my own mind are the span of control between a nursing manager and at level three and uh, 60 RNs at <laughs> level two, uh, because I cannot in my own mind see how a level three manager of nurses can be held accountable for the effectiveness of 60 nurses. And so for me, that represents a, a fracture. I don't have an answer for it, but a fracture in the accountability system. How, how have you thought about that? How have you resolved it? Uh, I, I'm really very interested. We know 
the, the argument is usually, well, they're professionally trained, they're professionals, they don't need to have the supervision. But in any other organization, you might have uh, an engineering department and a manager of engineers will probably not have Hispanic control more than 10 or 12. And, and now we're dealing with lives, lives at stake. How, how do you resolve that issue of an accountability system? I, do you want to take no, it well, first and I'll take it second? Well, Jerry, that, that, is the, that is the most difficult part. And it's not only just dealing with uh, level threes, dealing with the level twos. It's uh, also dealing with the level ones. And, um, and so um, in terms of trying to deal with savings, one of the things we did do is to ensure what level, level twos would do, because level twos were doing a lot of level one work. So we had to get that right. Uh, and to ch ensure that uh, level twos were, uh, make, make sure that the level, the work was done at the proper level was the, the first thing. So what, the next thing was that uh, we, we had to have uh, uh, certain level twos and uh, dealing with, and uh, dealing with level ones and, man and dealing with and supervising level ones and uh, level, and level threes dealing with level twos. And the, um, and the, clearly the uh, uh, spans of uh, spans of control um, are in our place now. They're anywhere from 40 to 50, and it's not it's not perfect. That's why we do performance reviews um, in terms of in dealing with the people every two years instead of every year. You can't do uh, when you're running 24/7 uh, people. You can't do it every year. There's just too many people when you're running 24/7 uh, operations. So we've taken a couple of the steps, and it's not perfect, and it's something that would still a work in progress. We haven't yet got that right, in my, in my view. So if I could, if I could add to that, it's, it's, it's a great question, and I think you've really kind of, kind of nailed the fundamental issue. I think in terms of, of the outcome, the, the outcome on the one hand is suboptimal. On the other hand, it's better than it was before. Right. So, so, so in terms of in terms of in terms of the, um, and and I know you agree with that in terms of your experience as well, Jerry. In 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 terms of in terms of the changes, what you tend to find going into a healthcare organization is that you've got the head nurse of the ward or whatever term you want to use for it, and that person's accountable for everyone. Well, if you start to look at the positions. There, there are some fundamental differences, or should be, between a, a stratum two nurse and a stratum one nursing assistant, or registered nursing assistant, or practical nurse. There are a whole bunch of different titles. So these should be more stratum two roles. These should be more stratum one roles. The stratum three head of the unit is accountable for all. And of course, you've got that gap so, so, so that you, you get um, uh, really, really suboptimal work from those folks at a stratum one level because of that gap. So one of the changes is to put in a stratum two manager for those stratum one folks. So that was, that was, that was part of a, a positive change. The other, thing, the other thing that we haven't done yet, and we actually, we actually did this analysis, we've, we've done this analysis I guess 15 or 20 times, but we haven't done it here. Um, in terms of task analysis, what tasks are people doing? Um, what we found <clears throat> is that professionals, we've got 19 studies now, professionals spend about 50% of their time doing lower level tasks. You could pay someone less money to do just as well. The potential annual cost savings works out to about $10,000 per professional. If you, if you look at, and we don't have a study on this yet, but if, you, but if you look at what the, what the registered nurse does, who should be a stratum two position, my hypothesis would be that somewhere around half the work is probably stratum one tasks that could be done by someone at a lower level. And so we're hoping at some point to be able to do a study like that. And it's, it's, it's ironic because on the one hand, Healthcare is really constrained in terms of funding. But on the other hand, this is such a fundamental issue that goes right across healthcare and hasn't been dealt with yet. So I'm really hoping that we will have an opportunity, perhaps with George, yeah. to take to, to do some research on that and, and provide some data in terms of what, what my hunch is, 
is a, is a tremendous opportunity to make healthcare better and also significantly reduce the costs. Um, if you can repeat my question. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, so what Jerry's basically saying is that in terms of that broadest span of control, in terms of the 3-2, it, it really is excessive in terms of being held accountable and in terms of providing effective managerial uh, accountability and work. Uh, and we would agree at suboptimal. Well, Jerry's suggesting that maybe through the RO methodology, one could, could go to the policymakers in terms of saying, look, you think you're saving a lot of money, but in fact, here are some of the issues with that. Good point. We need to uh, wrap up. Ken's giving me the kind of kind of get off the stage sign. So, uh, so thank you very much for your attention and questions. Thank you, George. Thank you, Rob. <laughs>